How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Women and minorities have been hardest hit by the economic impacts of the pandemic. The Biden administration's COVID recovery plans promise to prioritize equity alongside growing jobs and addressing climate change. How can that all happen together? Join us for a conversation on building back an inclusive and green economy with Julian Brave Noisecat, Vice President of Policy and Strategy at Data for Progress. Julie Pullen, Director of Product at Jupiter Intelligence, and Alicia Seiger, Managing Director at the Sustainable Finance Initiative at Stanford. Julian Brave Noisecat, I'd like to begin with you. You spent time learning the native language of your mother at a time when she was one of only about 200 people who spoke it. How does that experience inform your work on loss in the face of climate disruption? Yeah, just to clarify, it was actually my my cat, my grandmother um, who speaks uh, uh, the Sequetmuk language. Uh, my mother's uh, an Irish and Jewish New Yorker, so it'd be quite the feat <laughs> if she uh, if she had learned my <laughs> my my dad's mother's language. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, you know, as I I guess just alluded to, uh, I am a citizen of the Sequetmuk Nation from what is now. Uh, British Columbia, Canada. I'm also a descendant of the the Leewat Nation of Mount Curry, also in in Canada, um, but grew up actually in Oakland. So it's very nice to be invited to speak to the Commonwealth Club and really appreciate the invitation. And I'm really excited to engage in this conversation. Um, but you know, I think that at its core, climate change is is in part the loss of a climate and atmosphere and world uh, that supported civilization and, and human society as we know it. Um, and in that sense uh, does pose an existential threat to the world that we inherited from um, our ancestors and parents and, and prior generations. And we are now breaking from that in the process of breaking from that. For some people and communities, this is not the first existential threat uh, that we have faced. And in particular here in North America, if we're talking about um, instances of apocalyptic breaks from what came before, um, you know, we have to acknowledge the genocide um, and theft of the majority of an entire continent from uh, First Peoples here. And... Um, you know, I think that the trauma that that causes, the loss of cultures and ways of life um, that go along with that are, uh, you know, still present in the community that, that I come from, the people that I come from, uh, but that at the same time, um, and more hopefully, you know, I think people are remarkably um, resilient and, uh, you know, try to create the continuities of culture and in this case language and you know love for for community and each other that come along with those things in the face of those of those challenges in the face of those um, existential and otherwise apocalyptic circumstances and I think culturally and from like a humanities um, and philosophical perspective I think that those um, stories and experiences can be sources of strength as we uh, think about uh, big, challenging issues uh, like climate change today. Yeah, stories can explain, they can heal, all sorts of things. We'll get into that. Thank you, Julian. Julie Pullen, your climate concern went to a deeper personal level when you were a professor in the Philippines witnessing the devastation that burning fossil fuels is bringing now to that nation. How did that impact you and how did it change your career focus? Thank you for that. Yeah, it's nice to be here um, in conversation with all of you. I, um, prior to that experience that you reference, I had been a professor of engineering at, um, at an engineering school. And my focus had been on how the realms of the ocean, the atmosphere, and the river systems are linked together. And um, 
simulating those linkages um, in order to be able to do a better job at predicting. Um, I went to the Philippines in 2018 as a Fulbright visiting professor on sabbatical, and I was with the University of the Philippines and um, teaching tropical meteorology and saw firsthand the impacts of um, typhoons on my field site in the north of the main island of Luzon, um, which was being perpetually um, hit by typhoons. Um, and it's this beautiful stretch of coastline where the river uh, joins the mountains and, and the ocean. And um, it was heartbreaking to see the impact of climate change directly on the landscape and on the people that I had come to love so much. As a consequence, it really galvanized and catalyzed me to do much more around um, climate and to sharpen my focus on climate in my work. Um, I came back to the United States. I joined Jupiter Intelligence, um, a climate risk analytics startup in order to help um, businesses and other entities develop much more precise notions, quantitative notions of their exposure to um, climate change to help catalyze them to do more uh, in, in advance of this, this really urgent cri climate crisis that we are in. Mm, thank you for that. Alicia Seiger, your climate awakening began reading Al Gore's seminal book, Earth in the Balance, and his articulation of the need and narrative was compelling, but distance from you personally. When did climate become personable, personal and actionable for you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, that was my entree. Uh, it was not something I ordered. It was actually something I read as part of a required uh, uh, course. Uh, but it, it really um, started my transfiction with this question of how to harmonize human and ecological systems and tying back to Julian's comments, while still uh, in college, I actually, for my senior thesis, wrote uh, a, a study of intellectual property rights as a means to preserve cultural and biological diversity for indigenous communities. And so I, I had this understanding and appreciation at the time of, of other ways of living that were more in harmony with nature. Uh, but I felt my skills and interests were really more in the business community. And so I uh, was started from this intersection of humans in the environment to business in the environment and was really captivated first actually by Anita Roddick and, and the work she did uh, with the body shop as kind of the first example of this business as a, as a force for good. Uh, and as time went on, that intersection evolved from humans and in the environment to business in the environment to capital in the environment to going all the way up to the supply chain to understand how capital throw, flows through our economic systems and what that uh, what the implications of those capital flows are for our for our ecological systems and and for for climate change and I you know it was so I've been at this uh, for for three decades now but it's really been in the last five years, I would say, where this these uh, problems that had seemed like something we should be anticipating and, and be planning for uh, really hit home. And, and I think for me, that's been the fire seasons. You know, I live in the Bay Area too, and I've grown up here all my life. There was never a fire season, uh, but now, you know, starting in, you know, the summer, but, but running through the fall, there's this, a sense of eerie anticipation. I'm actually up here in wine country now with my family, and it's such a peaceful and beautiful and tranquil setting, but there's a new sense now of concern and of anticipation for what the increased you know, heat and drought um, and, and wind events do to a place like this. So the urgency around these challenges has, has come much faster and, and sooner in my professional life than I had anticipated. And fires are interesting because that's one area where, uh, Julian, you know, indigenous cultures have been looked to as, hey, that you might have some solutions. So, um, you know, that's at least for me, having done this for the last 14 years, the one instance where kind of white dominant culture looked to indigenous cultures and say, hey, you've been managing, not you, um, indigenous cultures have been having cool burns and, and controlled fires, whatever the, the name is, to kind of manage forests in a different way than Smokey the Bear. So, so she, tell us a little bit about how that might contribute to the larger conversation about dealing with climate. 
Yeah, so I think fire management is a really interesting one, right? Because there's a long history of indigenous peoples, including in California, um, using controlled burns to uh, prevent large scale wildfires, to regenerate um, habitats, to promote, promote biodiversity, et cetera. There's also actually really fascinating ways in which um, controlled burns in particular habitats help foster um, some of the um, not just like, you know, uh, plants and, and foods and um, animals that people hunt and gather from to provide sustenance, but also um, uh, create good materials for basket making and things like that. In California, for example, there's a really incredible history of um, indigenous basket making that was uh, almost um, annihilated through the, the history of genocide that happened in the state. Um, and this is not just particular uh, to control burns and, and fire management, but you know, if you look at the way that uh, the United States and Canada have come to manage the, the fisheries, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, um, there's actually a lot of practices that have come to mirror um, prior indigenous forms of fisheries management. Um, in those places. Uh, and then more broadly, um, you know, still to this day, about 80% of the world's biodiversity is found um, in indigenous lands and territories. Um, and it just logic says that if you want to preserve that biodiversity, um, and there's also lots of studies that suggest this as well, um, you know, giving indigenous peoples uh, title to their lands and also um, you know, pursuing conservation strategies that emp empower indigenous peoples as environmental stewards and managers can be very effective. In fact, the Canadian government is going to invest more in, in just that sort of a thing uh, through its Guardian Watchman program uh, when it releases its fiscal year 2021 budget uh, later in April. So these are real solutions. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that, right, is that we, in especially this country, the United States, we don't imagine indigenous peoples as living in the present, um, let alone, you know, having solutions for the challenges of the 21st century. Um, that is a very radical reconception of, in the American imagination of, of our people. Lisa Seiger, you know, clearly one of the perverse things that I feel from the, from the last year is how so many people have been out of work and yet the stock market keeps going up. If you're in the stock market, you know, Jeff Bezos, I think his wealth has increased $75 billion during COVID. You know, the markets have gone up while so many people are suffering. It's something that seems to be really perverse. But how do you think markets would react to a $10 trillion or even a $2 trillion climate and infrastructure plan? As the person kind of thinking about financial markets here, is that a welcome? Sure. Uh, <laughs> it puts a lot of tailwind into uh, interests that investors have already uh, expressed around net zero uh, investment portfolios and net zero asset managers uh, commitments. Uh, and so it was spent well, um, that money can be starting to uh, initiate the transition uh, across multiple sectors, the economy and the, and the, and, and I've just been sorting through the details this morning too, but it's, it's, it's as comprehensive as one would hope in terms of uh, the electric power sector, transportation, housing stock, et cetera. Um, I think the risk, though, as you pointed out, the, this astounding and painful disconnect between the stock market and and the the, the sort of Main Street and Wall Street, for for to use the 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 I think appropriate metaphor, you see the same thing now as we are starting to look to finance as the way out of climate by greening the financial system and getting more products in the market that have you know an ESG label uh, or you know green label or a net zero label and and the risk and the things that we are focused on, you know, in our work at Stanford is that that is, uh, could end up being another example of, of this kind of disconnect where the financial system looks green, uh, but the real economy is still very uh, dirty and unsustainable. And so the challenge in, in marrying the, the uh, government expenditures and support with with uh, the investment community is is doing it in such a way that um, you're not just moving capital around and making money you're doing it in such a way that you are actually putting real heft behind the energy transition uh, getting capital where it needs to flow to reduce the costs of many of these technologies as, as Gates talks about the green premium of, of many of these technologies but in many ways it's just deploying the technologies that we have 
uh, but but getting the incentives aligned so that those even though they're cheaper um, from an economics you know perspective, there they um, in many cases there are other barriers that are keeping those technologies from being deployed. And so it's not just the capital; it's the alignment of that capital with the policy um, and set of incentives that that help um, it flow in the direction and, and speed and scale that we need to decarbonize. Right. There's a scenario where, yeah, Goldman Sachs makes lots of money off of climate volatility and the people who are wealthy get even wealthier because uh, they're kind of a, off the volatility that climate is bringing to us. Uh, Julie Pullen, as a scientist who knows about the societal disruption already baked into the climate system, do you ever think we're just rearranging the chairs on the Titanic? Is all this money going to really make a difference? So that's that's a key part of where climate action comes in. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's, the, it's a, attention on climate risk. What's the exposure um, taking action on that front. It's um, taking action on the climate solutions um, and policy perspective. It's the spending on infrastructure, which if, I mean, if you look at the amount 700 billion for climate resilience across our power, water, um, road systems, buildings. I mean, that's that's massive. It's a massive investment in um, making our um, our infrastructure more resilient. And so, I, I do think it's one of those cases where, really, you know, everything here and and the potentially synergistically, if you look at them all together, these are um, have the potential to be really transformative. So as working for a company that does really like block level, neighborhood level kinds of, of forecasts, what are the areas that are really at risk? And if someone's going to try to move to a climate safe place, where should they move to, Julie Pullen? <laughs> Um, you know, I think it, it, it's it's very it's it varies across the country, of course, um, and you have to think not just a, across one particular peril like flood, um, but you have to also think about the heat waves and the intense precipitation events that we're experiencing. Um, places like Madison, Wisconsin, where my dad lives, I mean, they've seen unprecedented flooding, and um, that's no, no nowhere near the coast. And so, these experiences are are going to be increasing in the future. And um, it's really the, the aggregate or the combination of all the perils, which is what, what we focus on in quantifying a range of different possible um, exposures. And of course, then there's like a, there's a community level imprint on this too, because you have like different parts of our New York, New Jersey region are, are proceeding at different paces in their investments in climate resilience. And, you know, one of the things we do at the Waterfront Alliance is advocate for equalizing those investments and making sure they're directed at these underserved um, communities as well. And so, I, you know, I think it is, again, once again, the combination of the, um, you know, looking at the climate risk, but also building the, the, the climate um, resilience in into the mix right where you live now and advocating for that. Right, because all the financial incentives will be to, to protect the, the highest property values, which are the wealthiest neighborhoods. Uh, Alicia? Yeah, Greg, I just want to come back to your comment about rearranging deck chairs. It's a metaphor I use often, but I think it's, it's an important uh, question to come back to so that people appreciate that we can always make it better. <laughs> that there's, you know, there's no point at which we throw up our hands and say, well, we're rearranging deck chairs at this point, so let's just enjoy the music while it lasts. Uh, so, and, and there's a, a quote that I heard recently that I really appreciate that, that is this difference between optimism and hope. So the deck chairs, you know, this question, are you optimistic? And, and, and I think the, 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 the expression that, that, that I appreciated was that optimism is, is an Ameri a uniquely American trait that things will just work out. Um, and, and hope is the idea that with hard work, things will get better. And so, you know, we, we need to keep the hard work going um, because it can always, the, the trajectory can always be better than what it would be were we not doing the hard work. We have a market fundamentalism in this country that was significantly created and promoted over the past five decades or so by conservative philanthropists who funded research at think tanks and elite universities. Consequently, a large group of Americans think markets are more effective than government in solving many big problems. Alicia Seiger, will markets solve climate change? No. 
<laughs> and I've spent the last, you know, several decades trying to make it be so. I think there are great market-based solutions to climate, and I've and I've spent a lot of my career building them and pursuing them. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity, market opportunity, to uh, for wealth creation in this transition. And I think there's a lot that markets can do to align capital uh, where, as as people start to wake up to the realization and to the understanding that we are fundamentally altering our physical systems and that there are risks embedded in our investment portfolios and in our decision making that that are not part of our models um, there will be a and you're already seeing this a tectonic shift in how capital is invested and how portfolios are managed that said to meet the um timetables that are required that scientists have very clearly laid out for where we need to be in terms of our emissions trajectories and how um, essential it is to avoid some of the you know very scary negative feedback loops that we could unintentionally trip ourselves into we need policy to um, to align incentives to set the 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 roadmaps to accelerate this transition. And so markets could get us there eventually, um, but the timetables and the science don't, you know, don't permit that kind of laissez-faire. We really do need the, the policy um, piece to be you know, core and fundamental to, to get markets to move in the right direction. And then markets can be a magical tool. Julian Noyes, I'd like to hear your thoughts on yeah, building community around solutions. Because I tend to think about indigenous culture as being more in more community oriented, less atom, less uh, individual atoms. Yeah, I mean, I think that in the sort of climate solutions conversation, right, we talk a lot about physical infrastructure. We talk a lot about regulations. We talk a lot about price signals and incentives. And um, I think one of the things that I often sort of think about is what are the sort of forms of human resilience and community that, um, you know, play as important a role in fortifying, as important, if not more important, a role in fortifying communities against disaster and against immense challenges, um, you know, as like a seawall or things like that, you know, what are the, what are the elements of our culture? What are the elements of, you know, social relationships that um, can make us, you know, just sort of stronger as, as people and as people who share community and space and country with each other. And one thing that makes me very nervous um, is that if you look at sort of longitudinal polling on um, questions like whether people trust their neighbors um, and questions related to social trust, um, what you'll find is that over, you know, not just a few years, but over a long period of time, the number of people who will respond to a survey and say that they trust their neighbors um, has been fundamentally going down over a long period of time. And it's not just going down in our country, it's going down, um, you know, across many different um, countries and societies where we're asking a similar question. And, you know, I think that that um, slow creep of inhumanity and distrust for our fellow people um, is a really pernicious and scary thing. And I think that one of the most important and simple climate solutions is probably just compassion and love, right? The um, the commitment to uh, creating that sense of shared interest and solidarity um, between people. And I think that there are very particular projects in this country that are oriented towards creating more of that. Um, and I think that there are very clear um, projects in this country that are oriented towards undermining that. Reminds me of a, a book, uh, I think it was Deep Economy that Bill McKibben wrote. One of the major achievements of the American economy of the recent decades is building bigger houses further apart from each other. So we don't, you know, we're, we're further from our neighbors if you happen to be privileged to, to own one of those houses. But you know, there's, a, there's sort of um, more material wealth and, and, and more distance and, and separation. And, you know, to the point earlier about where should we go? Where's the safe place? I remember one person said to me, the best thing you can do about climate change is have neighbors who care about you.
Mm -hmm. Right. When, when the bad things come, you know, you can try to have all this hardware or gear, or you can have neighbors who care and you care about them and they'll, they'll come. As we wrap up here, I know we, we know that educating girls and empowering women are two of the biggest levers for reversing climate disruption. Solving climate requires collective action and women are often better at collaboration, which brings me to something that isn't talked a lot about generally in our country and particularly in the climate conversation, and that's the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, probably was before Julian was born, maybe uh, Alicia and, and Julie will remember that. Uh, but 38 states have passed the constitutional amendment. The original one has expired. There's a debate about whether to start over or breathe new life into the original amendment. You know, is that worth, Julie Pullen, is that worth putting energy into? So I think anytime that we can elevate the status and role of women across society, those are, you know, efforts worthy of consideration. I think there's also, um, you know, and putting energy into, quite frankly, but also um, you, if you kind of step back and think about drivers of the economy, I mean, there's a really astonishing statistic that two thirds of the wealth in the United States will be in women's hands by 2030. So, um, you know, not only is it about the more empowered decisions that educating women and girls lead to, but it's also about women's financial agency and in investing in planetary stewardship. And I think that um, we will continue to see more of that as women come into their, their own and having that kind of economic sense of power and the way that it can be used to um, really promote climate solutions and to accelerate our resilience in, in the face of um, the climate crisis. We're only beginning to see what that that will, will look like. I'm really um, excited. <laughs> I'd like to thank our friends at Bank of the West for underwriting this program. Bank of the West is walking the walk on moving away from fossil fuels that are destabilizing the climate that supports our lifestyles and our economy. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating and review. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.